Good afternoon, welcome to UK Column News. It is Tuesday the 17th of March 2015 and it's just gone one o'clock. Myself, Louise Collins, Brian Gerrish and Nick are here in Plymouth. And we have John Shackleton joining us from Portsmouth later on today. Well, soon. I think, I think we've just labelled you as Mike Robinson. So oh, this is Louise me. Collins, if, if anybody, anybody is surprised at that. Um, yes, we'll have John Shackleton joining us uh, shortly. Um, Weather first of all, well, it's pretty um, average out there in Plymouth at the moment. Uh, been grey skies, but a bit of sunshine peeping through. And we think much the same across the rest of the country. We're gonna kick off today with um, this uh, very sad announcement in the uh, Gazette and Herald. This is about a gentleman who was found dead on rail tracks uh, near a disused railway station. Um, and his name is Quinton Duckworth. And uh, this is an article saying that the police are um, after information surrounding his uh, death and they're saying, please contact Crime Stoppers. And you can do that anonymously on 0800 555 111. Um, the reason that we're putting this up on screen is we've been asked by a, a viewer of uh, UK Column if we can help, uh, because apparently this man was being um, bull bullied uh, we could use the word harassed by the police over a period of time before his uh, what appears to be untimely death. Uh, but that does not appear to be reported by the mainstream news at the moment. So we're going to say, can anybody help? Of course, take the proper action and contact the police. Um, but anybody who's got any knowledge of what was actually happening around the background and his relationship with the police uh, we'd be very interested yeah, in, in hearing. Uh, well, that brings us to, bre to uh, breakfast, breakfast, I think. Breakfast. So many households in this country start their day with a bowl of Cheerios or others. Um, but little do people know that the makers of Cheerios, General Mills, are currently in the process of being sued by the people of Minneapolis, who claim that General Mills polluted their air and water with more than 15,000 gallons of cartilage carcinogenic solvents that have seeped into the home's atmosphere and into their water. Only recently, General Mills were forced to remove 100% natural from 20 of its products as they had nothing but toxic and non-natural ingredients inside. And now it seems that um, it's getting even worse and that people in their homes and uh, residents in Minnesota, um, Minneapolis, was it Minneapolis? Minneapolis yeah, yeah. Are, are, you know, are um, fully failed to um, General Mills' products. So probably another um, indication that uh, you should certainly check packets before eating. Especially Nestle. We will see. Mm -hmm. uh, well, um, let's have a look at a little bit of nudging in the uh, local newspapers. And we come here to Nottingham. And um, Nottingham Post has, um, has got quite an interesting article about new licence fees for guns. Uh, the certificates are going to increase in price from 50 to 88 pounds, um, from 50 to 79.50. And this is to save Nottingham police money because they've apparently been losing a lot of money in the administration of um, gun licenses. Uh, what we'd like to point out is the nudging, because, of course, the photograph that uh, the Nottingham Post has cho chosen to use is a machine gun. And we think the nudging message is that law-abiding gun owners are maniacs who uh, use machine guns. And the reality, of course, is that criminals who are armed with guns don't bother with licenses in the first place. So if we analyze what's happening with gun licenses, um, the um, law-abiding members of society are being penalized, whilst, of course, no action is being taken against the criminals who are obtaining their guns through criminal activities. Um, but of course, uh, Nottingham Police, very big on licenses for law-abiding gun owners, uh, not so hot on dealing with child abuse, and particularly not so good with uh, Operation Daybreak around the abuse of youngsters at Beechwood Children's Home. And that brings us on very nicely to Melanie Shaw. Um, now, we did report yesterday that she was in Nottingham Crown Court. That's what we understood. But we now know that actually a trial took place in Nottingham Magistrates Court yesterday. But we still do not know whether Melanie attended that hearing. It's possible that she uh, was brought in on a Skype video link. 
Let's remind ourselves of the charges that were brought forward, false imprisonment, crimes against the Telecommunications Act, two counts of harassment against persons unknown, and then we had judges telling Melanie that she had to accept VHS Fletcher's to represent her. This, of course, was the law firm she'd already sacked because, amongst other things, they were using clerks as if they were solicitors, thereby saving the, money, uh, the company money. Melanie's lay legal advisor was blocked from contacting her in prison. And then the same VHS Fletcher's, we understand, has been asking for Judge Pert to rehear the case. Uh, well, this is what happened yesterday. The two counts of harassment against persons unknown, those charges were discontinued. Uh, now, effectively, this means that they've been dropped. However, for those charges to appear in the magistrate's court, they had to have, first of all, been cooked up by the police and then rubber-stamped by the Crown Prosecution Service. Now, we'd like to ask anybody who is fully trained in the law how it's possible to have a crime against persons who are unknown. Obviously, in this case, there were no witnesses to the fact that unknown persons were harassed. Um, but um, Can we not ask somebody who knows the law? Well, we're doing it now, actually. Okay. We're saying anybody who's listening to this report, can we uh, say, can you give us some help on this charge and how the Crown Prosecution Service should have pushed it forward? What about John? He's pretty up on the law. We'll ask him in a second. Okay. Just, uh, okay. just give you this one. Fire. So here we've got Melanie uh, Shaw. Several people have said to us, how do they get in contact uh, with Melanie? Well, here she is with her prison number and, of course, the address for HMP Prison Peterborough and um, we'd also ask for people of course to write with your concerns to Prime Minister David Cameron. We'll be hearing shortly about the good work he's doing to protect youngsters from child abuse and of course Home Secretary Theresa May who has wasted months in cooking up an inquiry. Can I just say there is a UK column official Melanie Shaw page where there are templates of letters and everything you need, like with questions asked, you know, just just edit it around your own, you know, with your own words. Um, but just a few little comments um, on that Facebook page with all documentation if you need it. But you know, I think we should talk to John about Indeed. his thoughts on this. So, John, John Shackleton, are you there? Can't hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Hi. Hi. Uh, how are you doing? We're doing fine. So, come on then. What are your thoughts on Melanie Shaw and the case? Uh, well, when a government tries to gag a person and uh, and imprison them uh, via Nottingham Police, something quite clearly wrong, isn't it? And then, then they're just they're making it up as they get along. Uh, the legal system in this country collapsed many, many years ago, and it's unfortunate that I say that because I, I, I've obviously studied law for a number of years. Uh, and studied criminology, but I'm a, a contract lawyer rather than a, a criminal lawyer. Sometimes they, do, sometimes they can hide people's identification. They can make people anonymous if, uh, if they need to be protected, like rape victims, etc., etc. But in this case, it's just made up waffle. What? That's what I see. There's nothing lawful about any of this. What about the, um, them bringing in Fletcher's? when Melanie clearly doesn't want Fletcher's representing her. Is this, is this legal? Can the, can the judge put on and tell her who she can and can't have representing her? The, the judge cannot, no. And you, you could look at uh, Lord Diplock and what Lord Diplock said about a fair trial uh, and, you need, and, and the right to have uh, lawful or legal uh, bodies represent you. It's down to the individual to choose that person. And if a person doesn't want a, a solicitor's firm or whoever, a Mackenzie's friend or whatever you want to call it, to represent them, then they have that legal right in law. So there's, there's, a, lot, there's a lot of illegal activity happening. And, and obviously, our human rights is, is, is being breached. Massive. Yeah. Um, uh, John, if, if I may, one of the things I find particularly offensive with the way that uh, Melanie Shaw is being treated in court is, of course, the judges saying to her, you, Melanie Shaw, need to accept VHS Fletcher's to represent you. So in the first instance, the judge is awarding VHS Fletcher's a contract because he's going to 
his uh, signature, his stamp will be ensuring that VHS Fletchers can call on legal aid money. So there's a nice little contract going on between the judge and VHS Fletchers. Um, and the second thing is, of course, that the threat is there to Melanie that if you don't agree with what the, the judge says, uh, the implication is that she's going to be deemed yeah. mentally unfit and um, her power to make decisions for herself is going to be taken away from her. This is very dark, offensive stuff. This is what used to go on in uh, the Stalinist courts or East Germany or, or even in the Nazi courts. It's dangerous. That's my opinion. It's very dangerous. I mean, the, the criminal courts, I mean, it's, it's all it's all. It's all gone backwards. It's not gone forwards. You know, as a, as a country that we led the way, you know, in terms of constitutional common law, etc., we led the way across the whole planet. And people respected our laws and, and, and what we stood for in terms of freedom and freedom of speech. And now that's all being gagged. And, you know, even the Supreme Court, who I've had a couple of conversations with recently, uh, very recently, actually, yesterday, not only about Melanie Shaw, but different other legal areas, technical legal arguments. They're not interested, absolutely not interested. And, and this is where we find ourselves. I, I don't want to go on and on because it's your show, not mine. But the, the police are even hiding it. You know that, I know that. Uh, and then the courts are hiding it. So we'd get, we've got no recourse from the Crown Prosecution Service who have already been informed that they're not adequate, that they're not fit for purpose. And, and even the Home Ops have told them that. But we sit here now having this conversation and you couldn't make it up, could you? You just no. couldn't make it up. Well, un un no. Unfortunately, we don't have to make it up. But we no. just move on a bit, and the subject is child abuse. And um, let's see how the uh, the main stories are um, developing in the in the news. And I, I've then got some comment on this, but uh, Louise, you'd picked up on the mails. Yeah, so report. mainstream are finally breaking the child sex abuse cover-ups that have been going on. Here, the mail go into detail at how, why and who were being hidden by top Met officials. So let's start with victims' complaint. The victims claim that high-profile politicians, diplomats, civil servants and celebrities visited in the 1970s and 80s Elm Guesthouse Barns in London. Victims say they witnessed murder along with serious amounts of abuse. Uh, moving down the road a few miles to Dolphin Square, uh, which is literally a stone throw away from private residents of many top politicians and lords and ladies. Uh, here the victims say that police were fully aware of the sex parties and who was attending. Now embedded within this male story, there is a, a piece on how Cyril Smith was held by police at a sex party at a house in Streatham, South London. He apparently was held at a police station. You can go on because this covers it as well, yeah. Um, he was held at a police station. Officers recovered evidence, including notebooks, videos and uh, much more. But those officers were ordered to hand over all evidence and told to keep quiet or they will be prosecuted under the Official Secrets Act. Now, um, we know that there have been many police officers who are desperate to talk out about mm. the murder of a young boy on the day of the, um, the royal wedding. Mm. I can't think of his name at the top of my head. Um, but there are many, many people... Um, who have been told that they, they couldn't continue on the investigations and they believe it was linked to uh, Elm Guesthouse. So it's now coming more and more apparent, hopefully, to the to the wider public that there has been some sort of cover-up with regarding this shocking abuse that went on with the, surrounding our politicians and elites. Indeed. So let's um, go back in time a little bit to the famous occasion where um, David Cameron was... Uh, on television talking to Mr Schofield mm. and uh, thank you very much um, to the lady that sent this through to us today obviously we've seen it before but her point was have a look at what David Cameron was saying against the backdrop of what we now know uh, so this is the uh, report when was it well it was the 8th of November 2012 and we've just got a little snapshot of the words that came out of the mouth of David Cameron and he was saying anyone who has any information about anyone who is a paedophile, no matter how high up in British society they are, that is what the police are for. We are a civilised democratic country under the rule of law with a police force with a justice system. 
if there is any evidence that investigations were not conducted properly or inquiries were held that didn't get to the bottom of things, then the government has to act. And that is exactly what we have done in relation to the North Wales investigation. So seen against that, uh, of course, we now know that there were cover-ups and blocking of investigations at every level. And of course, it's now been revealed that it was not only senior police officers that were blocking investigations, but also Britain's security services. So the evidence is right in front of David Cameron's face. It is right in front of the face of Theresa May, the Home Secretary. And what are we seeing? A continuation of the cover-up that paedophiles are operating through and around British Parliament in Westminster. Well, let's dig deeper. And of course, the Mail has come up with this story, which is... Uh, saying that um, Sarah Thornton, the chief constable of Thames Valley Police, uh, with her officers, had been threatening a cabinet office, uh, cabinet office minister, Rob Wilson. Let's bring him in. And uh, what was the aim of the game? Well, it was to stop him putting his nose into um, to investigate child abuse. And he alleges that uh, Sarah Thornton and her officers threatened him to get him to drop uh, the investigations that he was conducting. Now, of course, uh, Sarah Thornton has said, well, this is all totally unfounded. So we'd like to remind people that it's been uh, the UK column alone that has identified that a very brave Asian gentleman, having made 80, 80 reports to Thames Valley Police about physical and sexual abuse of children at Oxford and Cherwell Valley College, was then himself harassed and threatened and lost his job in a cover-up which included the head of Oxford and Cherwell Valley College, the um, chief executive of Oxford County Council, and indeed Sarah Thornton and her officers. Mm -hmm. So we're going to say welcome to Child Protection Thames Valley Police style under the hand of Chief Constable Sarah Thornton. And of course, where is this lady going to go? She's going to be promoted into running police policy across the country. Can the people who have been warned off back in historical times to warn off those uh, those officers and those people who are involved in the case, why now, if now it's the perfect opportunity to come forward, Cameron's given you the go ahead, you know, you can just use that piece of video that he has said that people must come forward. So now is the time for all these people who Absolutely. were told to be quiet and shut up to come forward because you've got it there from from the great leader. Anyone who knows about it needs to come forward. So it's now to, you know, your conscience, clear your conscience. We need people forward. to come forward, but of course we need their reports to become fully public uh, before they go near the police because in Nottingham we've got a child abuse victim who has been locked up in prison for the sole objective of silencing her. So it is becoming more and more clear that the paedophile rings are being run through the systems which are supposed to be there to protect the children. So let's have a look at the BBC and uh, we're going to thank one of our own supporters for bringing this to our attention. But it's a little bit of a uh, Twitter spat that's been going on with Peter Henley, uh, who's one of the reporters for the BBC in the Oxford area. Um, we've titled it Meet the Arrogant Face of the BBC as it d dismisses another child abuse case. Now, what was the spat about? Well, uh, Peter Henley was uh, told about this lady, Nicola Stanbridge, reporter for Radio 4, who was pulled off an investigation into child abuse at Oxford and Cherwell Valley College. And uh, the voice recording of the telephone conversation where she says she's been pulled off is on the UK column site. Well, let's come back to uh, Peter and see what he says. Well, this is the exchange that took place. Um, so uh, basically, uh, the British Constitution Group said to him, did you see the report on Nicola Stanbridge? Um, lots more to report from Oxford that you should cover. And then he was asked a question, was it a BBC policy decision not to? Uh, his reply was certainly not. Why would you think that? And uh, 
back went the British Constitution Group to say, Peter, did you listen to the conversation? Who pulled Nicola Stanbridge off the case? A brave Asian gentleman lost his job for exposing abuse. Not news, question mark. And here's the damning reply. He says, one reporter not progressing one story. There is no BBC policy. We look at dozens of story stories for each one that gets to air. So here is the man telling you that as far as the BBC is concerned, child abuse is just another story. And we've got so many of them coming in. We just simply don't bother to report. We've got problems inside the BBC. Is there a BBC policy, Peter Henley? There certainly is. The BBC policy is to not tell the truth about the scale of child abuse in UK, including in the BBC you see. itself. Exactly. exactly. OK, next. Mike Davis, who is a council worker for Cardiff City Council, has just received a nice 30,000 payout for his redundancy. Mr Davis, 52, um, actually appeared in court last week over indecent images of children and animals were found on his computer. Davis was handed a three-year uh, three community sentence, which will be, uh, and, and he'll be listed on the Sex Offenders Register for five years. Uh, what concerns me most is that Cardiff City Council had absolutely no idea that Mr Davis was being investigated um, or arrested or charged, but until after his conviction. And uh, he still received his full pay package, thought to be worth around £30,000. He had various roles within the council. And that concerns me more than anything. Yes, it's shocking he's got had these images, but the fact that Cardiff Council had absolutely no clue and kept this guy in post while he had these disgusting images on his computer and God knows what else, um, that he's staying in staying in, in, in position. It's worrying. I think they knew, and I think this is more of the same, that probably he knew too much, and we seem time after time councils protecting these people of course, Oxfordshire County Council and City Council were doing the same thing. If you want to hear uh, things as it really is, then have a look at some of the videos from the British Constitution Group. Um, you can go to the website. We haven't got a new video up today, uh, but if you go to the website, you can see the videos already posted. And we are working hard to get up the series of videos that relate to the creation of uh, grand juries. We know there are a lot of people waiting for this information at the moment. We want to get it right and we want to make sure those videos do the job. Well, one of our speakers, of course, was John uh, Shackleton. And uh, John, really over to you. I think you want to tell us about what is what's happening in the country with regard to the stealing of property and the poverty that's creating. Yeah, we, we've got a we've got a massive problem, as we know. I mean, we. Talk about paedophilia. I mean, that is that is a major, major concern. But there's there's a there's an agenda, you know, that's going on. And you look at what the government are doing. Uh, they, they've set up a company called UKAR, which is UK Asset Resolution. Uh, it's a management company, uh, and this company's been the, the focus focused on on the Crawford family and, and Tom's property and trying to take his property twice. And they're doing it all up and down, up and down the country. So we've got this, the side of things where we've got response that's been set up to, to help and stop the evictions, which is absolutely brilliant. But if, if you look at the land grabbing, and, and we've we've had a few of us that are investigating the land grabs. Can you hear me at all? Yep, we yes. can hear you. Oh, oh excellent. Uh, and I've, I've just been looking at some of the statistics, and I, and you guys have got statistics as well. But the Lake District is something that we we discussed. A week or two ago, they try to sell eight plots of land off. Now, this is quite interesting to me because I'm I'm trained in commercial law, if you like contract law, and one of the questions that that I I place to them is, where's the proof of this ownership? Where's the proof that this trust owns the land? It doesn't own the land. It's the people's land. We know it. They know it. But yet they're selling plots of this land, which is it's illegal. It's completely illegal activity. So I beg the question to them again, where is the proof that you've purchased this land? What gives you the right to sell something that the people of this country own? And 
and that's just a small detail. Yeah, look, looking at looking through some of the stuff. Sorry, I'm I'm taking my eyes off the screen at the moment. But Eurostar was sold recently for 757 million. That's an asset that we've got in this country that we've just we've just lost. Where that money goes to, God only knows. I don't Do you know who's bought it? Uh, I think it's somebody from China. I oh. think it's somebody from China. Okay. China are doing some interesting things in our country at this moment in time. You know, mm. uh, there's a lot of things that seem to be mirroring with uh, Chinese law and gagging orders. And uh, I, I do blame, you know, the Home Office a lot for this. You know, you, we talked about El Mouse and Dolphin Square, etc. earlier in the show. Now, the Home Office have had documentation. Theresa May has got documentation proving what happened there. And nothing's happened with it. And David Cameron's doing his little sound bites. Sorry, I'm trying. I'm, I'm going on the sideline here, aren't I? But he's, he's doing these sound bites saying all these paedophiles we need to get and we need to act, etc., etc. I've not seen one MP that's been brought to justice, and they've got the facts. But I've transgressed, and I, I do apologise for that. But it's something I'm passionate about, you know. Having children, their safety is paramount, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, but yeah, so the euro style of sold. Uh, the Ch Channel 4, I don't know if you know this, but Channel 4 is owned by the government. And they're mm. trying to sell that off. This is something that I'm, I'm looking into right now. Uh, the NHS, well, you know, we've covered stories about the NHS, haven't we, in, in recent weeks. And Cameron's saying he's not selling it off whilst he's giving lucrative contracts to some of his, some of his friends, you know. Uh, I'm sure David's listening as well, so I, I just want to wait. And it's a polite thing to do. Uh, the Bank of England story, which you covered yesterday, was very interesting. Uh, and I'm, I'm doing this because this is asset stripping. So the Bank of England are trying to do a deal with China so that we have one big world bank. And that's a story that I think people should look at and look into it because this has got serious implications for our country. Uh, then you look at Devon and Cornwall Police, who are owned by IBM. Yeah, yeah. We can prove it. There's no doubt about it. Again, it, it's kind of an... I'm just bringing it to the public that these are all our assets that are being stripped away from us. If IBM create a criminal offence down in Devon and Cornwall, are the police going to investigate that? Mm. They're paymasters, you know. And then uh, I spoke to somebody, a nice person in the Department of Health, who confirmed to me that they'd sold assets last year worth £520 million. Where's the money gone? They keep saying that the short of money in the NHS, and I do believe in certain areas they are. Well, where's this £520 million pounds gone? And then the sites released to date from the government, this Conservative government that love our land, sold 899 sites. Guys, if we don't stand up, uh, stand up to this, and we don't stand up to this asset stripping, our children are going to have nothing, you know? And uh, it, it's, it's very serious. We drive down the road and woodlands are up for sale and, you know, countryside. English countryside, English heritage... Stonehenge, because yes. Stonehenge, prime Absolutely. example. Yeah. Yeah. Um, John, we just got um, a couple of your slides, which really, yeah. I think, bring it home, because you've asked the question, where, where does this end up? Well, where it ends up is for these poor people who are now sleeping on the streets. And, of course, um, in London, they've taken special measures to put spikes, spikes on the pavements yeah. to even stop people being able to sleep on, on the streets. And I'll just bring the other one in here. This is... Um, from a demonstration. Can you tell us about this? Homes for the many, not the few, is the banner. That's right. This was in London, and it's quite heartwarming. Uh, thousands upon thousands of people turned up. Uh, obviously, it was all over the BBC and mainstream news, wasn't it? We all saw it on the mainstream news about these thousands of people. That is it erupted. Russell Brand's initiative? Is this the whole Russell Brand thing? I, I don't want to go down the Pied Piper no, thing. <laughs> I don't trust uh, Russell Brand as far as I know. No, but is this the demonstration of that council, the, the housing the housing group that was selling off the property? Oh, this is something completely different. All oh, right, OK. Yeah, this is something completely different. And it was good to be amongst some of them because, if you like, I, I attended there on behalf of, of Response and, and, and some others just to try and help the guys. And there's so many fractions and so many different groups that really, and we've talked about this in the past, we should be working together. But... It seems like people have got these egos, you know, and it's not helping the movement, you know. We, like, you look at that, I mean, thousands upon thousands of people all get together. Each one of them had a different group and, or a different organisation, but we were all united. 
And this, we need to see more of this. We need to see more of us getting united and stop the, if you like, the backstabbing and the agendas that go on, on across social media where people are running and living their lives on social media and not getting out there and doing something. So Agreed. Please, you know, get, join us and get out there and, and, and let's save our land and save our homes or like the chap that was on the streets. Okay. Next to him. John, th thank you very much for that. Of course, we're going to be doing more with you on the detail of what's actually going on in the country. But I'm really pleased today because this was sent through to me. I'd missed it. Uh, what more do we need to say? We've now got <coughs> mainstream media. Uh, what's the headline? When our army may be cut to 50,000 men, the smell of treason is becoming offensive. Uh, now, of course, the UK column was predicting 40,000 men uh, at least five, six years ago. We knew what was happening in the country. Uh, but here it is now coming mainstream. We are talking treason. That's what you're talking about, John, with the selling off of assets that belong to the people of this country. And of course, it isn't being done by the government. This is being done by individuals. And uh, we are very happy to put up here. This is the man at the moment with the lead responsibility for treason in the country. David Cameron, the prime minister, he knows exactly what's happening in the country. And the word is treason, as Breibach um, correctly says. Now, what has the UK column been doing over the years? Well, we have been warning and warning what uh, not only Mr Cameron, but of course Nick Clegg is the uh, creation of the two horrors. Uh, what were we saying? Well, here's the newspaper and uh, we've got it here, collaborators in treason. So finally, we're seeing the mainstream news waking up. Uh, we're going to rub it in because back here in 2008, what was the UK column talking about? Well, up in the box, we're saying UK treason exposed. And there's another one here. This was the outrage when 3000 people demonstrated against the dismantling of our constitution by the European Union. And what did the Daily Mail print? Uh, it printed page after page about plastic bags. But our headline there, again, was saying what is happening is treason. And uh, if we think it's uh, just for the Tories, uh, well, let's remind ourselves of uh, the sheer horrors that are the Labour Party. OK, so Blair put on a dinner last week for Hull City boss Assam Alam, to, according to the Mail, to secure cash to plug in a hole that unite my cause by withdrawing support for Miliband. So Asim Alam has already donated 200,000 this year and after his supper with Tony has pledged a further 300,000 and it's believed that if union, um, if, if the union unite finally withdraw support uh, for Labour, Mr Alam will do not donate a further 500,000 pounds. This latest meddling by Blair has infuriated the chair, um, chairman of Unite, Jim Sheridan, um, and he says a lot of MPs are members of Unite. Unite have given 1.6 million to the Labour Party to get Miliband into power. So if this guy, Alam and Blair, are working against the party, then I think people will be angry and frustrated. Alistair Campbell, Blair's ex-spin doctor, who is now assisting Miliband, made another attack on Labour candidates turning down donations from Tony Blair. So Tony Blair's doing his best to get his money in there. Uh, some Labour Party politicians are turning it down because they don't want profits from a warmonger, um, so Alistair Campbell's now in there meddling. Well, the, min <coughs> the minimum is that we've now got foreign money driving the political yeah. agenda in UK, and of course, uh, Tony Blair up to his neck in it. Yeah. And uh, he's also been uh, pulled up here for uh, UK border policy. Exactly. Ed Miliband actually said Tony Blair got it wrong about opening British borders. But Tony has come back saying he didn't agree that it was a mistake. All they did was bring forward the inevitable and that in 2004 the economy was booming and that there was a need for skilled workers. And what if we sent those skilled workers back to Eastern Europe? Blair said, would we be, any, would be, a, strong, would we be a stronger country? Uh, no. So there he is playing God. Now. Well, of course, I think uh, Tony, Tony Blair is absolutely right because um, he said he didn't make a mistake. Of course, he didn't because the policy was to create the exactly. open border policy. And as we always say, 
The fault is not with the people who came into this country because they were invited. The fault is with our own politicians who have betrayed democracy. Britain was booming, wasn't it? So it's time to crash it. Open that, the borders up, let's crash it. That's the agenda because that's how you form the dictatorship. Well, a pretty heavy uh, news today. We're going to end on light-hearted note. I'm told it's St Patrick's Day and uh, we're going to say happy St Patrick's Day. Day. I was going to say Begora, but I've no idea what that means. Somebody, no doubt, will tell me pretty quickly. Uh, but uh, we thought a good way to celebrate uh, Sir Patrick's Day would be to have a look at the band Mute Fish, which you can see on YouTube. Um, pretty spectacular music, which gets my vote. Uh, well, there you have it, um, an announcement that uh, if you come to our regular meetings in the George Hotel Plimpton, uh, tomorrow we will in fact be in Top Ness, so visit UK Column website and have a look at that. Uh, we're going to thank our guest John Shackleton today, um, you'll be seeing more of him. And uh, take the advice, we need to do things, we need a lot of people to start taking action. So if the minimum you can do is write a letter to <coughs> Melanie Shaw, please do. If you feel you can take on the politicians, please do that as well. We need you and your country needs you. Thanks for joining us. Bye. Bye-bye.